Welcome to this edition of Cup Chat with Birding with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Today, join me and special guest Pam Goolsby as we discuss the great backyard bird count. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cup Chat with Birding with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Uh, we are live on your Facebook page, so please comment and let us know that you're joining us and maybe where you're watching from. So if you're in Texas, tell us what county you live in. And if you're from out of state, let us know what state you're joining us from. So we're always excited to see our out of state friends join us. And so I am watching the comments today. And so also, if you have any questions um, as we speak, let us know. So today we wanna welcome our special guest, Pam Goolsby, like school and cool, but goosey. So uh, welcome Pam today. She's out of the Purville area. Um, and she is one of our match. She's also a master naturalist. So, it's, uh, fun fact: if you don't know what a master naturalist do, is, the Texas A&M Agrolife Extension Service and the Texas Parks and Wildlife Partnership. Go Google Texas Master Naturalist. It's a great program um, to be involved in. So, um, thanks, Miss Ellen, for joining us from Pennsylvania. So today, Pam and I are going to be talking about the great backyard birding count. Um, and before we can dive into that, I'll let Pam introduce herself a little bit, talk a little bit about your birding story, Pam, and how you got interested in birding. All right. Well, I got started in birding as far as loving birds from both of my parents. My father always would have me listen for the rain crow, of course, the yellow bill cuckoo. And then my mother was into wrens and, and sketched wrens quite frequently. And so I had a love for them, but then I got to my, um, got my children raised and did my job and finally wanted to get outside. And I was saying how much I love birds to my son-in-law, who is, I call him my scrub jay, because he is very sassy. And he said, if you love birds so much, why don't you learn their names? So I got me the golden book. <laughs> I started out the golden book and a little pair of, of um, binoculars and, uh, but the minute I got binoculars on a bird, that was it. But as far as my spirit bird, it's kind of a weird one. It's a black vulture. I love the black vulture. Um, got started with them at um, Lockhart State Park. I tell my husband over there to help me just in case I go blank. And uh, anyhow, there were a pair of them that I named Tweedledee and Tweedledum. And Aww. I used to see them. I'd go walking for three or four hours in bird. And I would take pictures and go back and try to figure out what I'd seen all of my own. And so these two were always around. So they were, I saw a lot of behaviors from them that I was, number one, I'd never seen black vultures living in the Dallas area. So I was fascinated by them and how smart they were and how uh, people always think that vultures, well, I guess turkey vultures are kind of boring, but black vultures are quite smart. They're really, they're kind of mischievous and I kind of like that. That's that's neat. And that's interesting, you know. Most people say they're spark birds or something super colorful and mm -hmm. um, small and cute. You know, mine, I love the I always say mine was a painted bunny. Oh yes. Well, and, and I, I call them bunnies because I thought <laughs> that's what my birding mom was telling me it was. And she was like, Don't you like the little painted bunnies? I'm like, Yes, I love the little painted bunnies. So I couldn't cute. love a painted bunny, yeah. Yes. But they're not really bunnies, they're bunty. And so I think I called them painted bunnies for at least at least <laughs> half a year before I realized that I was actually saying bunnies and not bunnies. Yes. Yes. And everyone else around me was wrong, right and I was completely wrong. So you mentioned your husband's back there somewhere, and is he a birder as well? Do y'all bird together? Yes, uh huh. I drug him into it. He he started doing it, and then once we took the class of uh, of the hawks with uh, Byron Stone, then he was really into it because he loves the hawks. And, oh, that's uh, cool. So the, I think the more you love, the more the more you learn, the more you love it because it's just always you never learn quite enough, and you want to learn more. So yeah. it's, uh, it's fun. And I think that's completely true. As I learn more, I become a better birder and I enjoy it more. Um, yes. I started out with no birding knowledge, zero. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and to and I can see how I progressed 
over the years of being involved with birding with extension because you go oh there's a bird that flew by and so you're just constantly seeing more birds versus mm -hmm. just not even noticing them um, yes it's like that, i think that's longer head shrike you know you go like what's wrong with that mockingbird you know <laughs> just look yeah. up and you go like there's something not right yeah Mm -hmm. Yes, I saw the cutest mm -hmm. mockingbird though yesterday. Maybe it was yesterday or the day before. And I had mm -hmm. to really take a look because he had fluffed up his feathers and he was really cute and fat and fluffy. And I was like, that's not a mockingbird. And then he flew mm -hmm. off. I saw his wing bars, but um, I yeah, just really foolish. Yes, I was thought yes. that was super cute. So we are supposed to be talking about the great backyard <laughs> birding count. We should mm -hmm. get to that. So the great backyard birding count, this is a perfect time to talk about it. Mm -hmm. because it is coming up in February. So the Great Bird, Backyard Birding Count is four days in February, and this is a historic citizen science project. Um, so what makes those four days unique, Miss Pam, um, to understanding our global bird populations? And tell us a little bit more about the Great Birding Classic and, and the history that you've been involved in. Well, it's for, for me, when I hear it, I just get out and bird more because I do eBird already. But um, I, I wouldn't nice, I thought about that question. I thought, well, that's a good question. You know, we've just had Christmas bird count. So how much has it changed from Christmas bird count to now to when March my, the mass migration starts? And that's my understanding is that one of the main things is to see the habitat where the birds are, you know, what birds are where, which ones have moved since Christmas. And uh, it used to be that was one of the main things, and I, I read that um, now that it's global, that's just one of the side benefits. But to me, it's fantastic to see the the um, how eBird will show all the different places where people are birding that particular day on the map, and the lights come up, and it's uh, it really makes you feel like you're part of something that that's important, which it is. Right, and it's mm -hmm. it is a truly global program. So give me the four dates. I did not write that down. What? Okay, do it start? starts on Friday. Uh, Valentine's Day is su Sunday this year. So it's going to be Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's the 12th through the 15th. So uh, it starts Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And so that's coming up. Now, mm -hmm. when you talk a little bit about the global populations and putting that data into eBird, I think you made a great point that at first, you know, we just did Christmas bird count. So we have all that data. We're about mm -hmm. to really start birding in March and have a lot of data from everyone from everywhere. Mm -hmm. But that great backyard bird count is kind of in the middle. So it really mm -hmm. can show you um, it's two great sets of scientific data in a relatively close period of time. And it's a designated four days. So it's not, um, so like the Christmas bird count, there's a designated set of days and so they know specifically that that data, everybody kind of ups their game during the four yes. days, per se, yeah. and we really get a good set of data points. So I think that's a great point. Now, how can birders get involved? It's coming up on the 12th. If someone mm -hmm. gets involved, can they still do that? Do they have, do you have to bird from your backyard? No, you don't. You can go to your favorite <laughs> place. Uh, I, I got tickled. One, one lady wrote about she lived in an apartment and she said, well, how can I do that? But she went out around the apartment and in the surrounding areas and it was amazing the number of birds because there a lot of trees and they were full of birds. You may go to your own place that you enjoy. I plan on going to our river trail, which I enjoy birding on. Uh, the Dietrich Center area and different places like that that I know there'll be birds but I'm definitely going to do my backyard first because it's amazing how you can take for granted. Like we were talking about different birds can all of a sudden that bird, you know, all of a sudden you look back and I think, oh, that's a bunch of house sparrows. And I look closer and it was chipping sparrows. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I could have missed that. So I think it, we put on our new eyes and, and go out and really look at our backyard. And also, it's a good time to look at your habitat to see if you're providing a good habitat. If you have a backyard or if you have acreage. Do you have places for those where those birds are welcome this time of year? Right. And Pam, we were talking before we went live that you have uh -huh. recently moved in Kerrville um, mm -hmm. from down in the valley to up on the hill. That's and right. So this will be your first great yard, great backyard birding count up on the top of the hill. 
Are you yes. excited yes. to see the differences in the species that you really see in your backyard? Yes, we've been inundated with the pine siskins up here. Um, I don't know if we were living down there now. I don't think we would have gotten them. They've been coming through in great numbers. When we first moved here, we had a zone tail hawk fly right by our balcony, you know, uh, things like that. So I'm, I'm anxious. I'm hoping our chipping sparrows stick around and lesser goldfinches and our roadrunner. I'm hoping he comes through. Uh, we have a pair of them that come through, a pair of Inca doves and things like that that we never saw down there. Of course, down there, we got a lot of uh, we had a, a family of starlings, <laughs> which was really exciting, but they are cute when they're babies. Starlings, you know, if you don't have 500 of them, they're pretty cute. So, um, yeah, just a difference. And we have a, a hummingbird that's coming through right now that's a, a Rufus Allens, uh, you know, could be either one. Mm -hmm. It's an immature, so it's, unless I could catch it and take it to somebody, we'd never know. <laughs> well, absolutely. That is so fun. Well, I think that'll be very interesting from your perspective of that you've done great bird, great backyard bird. It's a mouthful. I'm just saying. It is. I'm glad great you're saying backyard. it. Backyard GBBC. That's why they abbreviate that. GBBC. Yeah. You've done GBBC in your <laughs> backyard. I think that I think that will be a very interesting comparison to look at your data. Um, from your own eBird account to kind of just see the difference between elevation levels and the species you're really used to seeing um, mm -hmm. in one area and how many of those just change just simply. Mm -hmm. So, and I hate to jump back, you know, Cup Chat has no rules, Pam, I told you this. Oh, so, good. I'm, no I'm good rules. No so let's jump back a little bit and um, talk a little bit about how you got started birding and your mom being a artist and sketching. Um, that made me think to, to remind everyone that yesterday we mm -hmm. launched our first uh our first virtual birding seminar of 2021 so we're super excited and it's called get started sketching um, and we're going to be talking about how sketching even if, so here, here's the honest truth guys i probably pam you might be artistically inclined because of your mother being artistic but i am not and so <laughs> while i would love to be a great artist and sketch a beautiful bird like our presenter can it's also a tool just uh, to hone my burning, burning skills. So I look forward to participating in the program to just learn the basics of sketching birds as well. So that way I can um, improve my identification skills um, because it makes us focus a little bit more on the features that we're seeing um, and really slow down as we burn. So go register for that. It's $15. The link is up. Scroll down just a little bit from the Facebook video and $15. And that is going to, all those funds go to benefit our Rio Diablo Youth Birding Camp, which is this uh, June for high school youth who are interested in becoming advanced birders. Um, and so we're really trying to keep those, that cost as affordable as possible. So all the proceeds from that will go to support all those kiddos coming to camp. So right, there's right. my spiel. But that's neat that she was artistic enough. So are you artistic? You sketch a little bit? Uh, not as much as my children are. They're both in the arts. My son is a sculptor and my daughter is a graphic designer for James Avery. So. Oh, I am a James Avery fan. Oh, Let yeah, me, me tell too. you. <laughs> Will you please pass along to her that yes. I am so pleased and I know the rest of the world out there does not need to hear this, but when I was <laughs> in maybe seventh or eighth grade my mom gave me her daisy ring yes. and let me let me let me show everyone what the daisy ring looks like 10 plus years since i've been in eighth grade so it is a daisy ring and there's daisies all the way around this is not the original daisy ring because i have broken this i have squished it and i have added to it so uh it got to the point where it was so old and so and I had worn it down that I lost a whole daisy. Um, so I so they added gold bands and soldered them to it so it wouldn't break. But tell your daughter I'm so thankful that they brought back the daisy ring this year. Okay, I will be sure and do that. Yeah. Because I went out and bought one in case my original one breaks, I will have a backup daisy ring. Yes, I understand. So, 
Yeah, anyway. I, I received some back in 1961. A daisy ring? No, not a daisy ring, oh. but different different charms that she bought. Who knew that back in 61 that they were selling them at different churches? So different. Uh, that's kind of how he got started. So it's interesting. It's part of Texas. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, mm -hmm. uh, please pass on my compliments to the, your daughter that I love Will the daisy do. ring being back. Okay, yeah. we'll do. <laughs> so, okay, so being moving and being in the Hill Country area, we've seen so many rare alerts for rare, rare birds this year. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about any rare birds you've kind of seen come through your area. Um, mm -hmm. And are you hopeful um, that we're going to kind of see that rare bird trend um, continue through Great Bird, Great BBC? We're not going to even try to say it anymore. Oh, I, I would imagine so. It seems like to me that the more people that are out, I think the birds are there. I think the more people out, the more people that uh, will be able to spot them. And I think it's really important too. One thing that, that I want to be sure and bring up is if people only have 15 minutes, I, I think that's a, something that I read that I thought was really important. If some people say, well, I have to go to work or I have children, I don't have time, pick out 15 minutes and participate one day or all the days, or you can bird all day if you want to. Uh, so I think if people are a little bit afraid that Oh, if I get on eBird and I make a mistake, I'll be embarrassed. And I don't think that you need to do that. You need just to step on in and uh, do. you can go to Merlin and you can use, you know, Merlin to help you identify. Uh, you can take a picture, you can sit down with your book. And that's the, that's the way I, I started learning. And then I was lucky enough to get with different organizations. Yeah. And you can do me. it and you can reach out to different organizations in your area and, and see, if, I mean, with COVID, there's mm -hmm. a lot of different rules this year, but they, you do, you can do it as a group. There are group mm -hmm. rules. So if yeah. you want to go out birding as a group for your great bird, great, oh, great backyard GBB. birding. <laughs> GBBC. Yeah. If you want to yeah. go out and bird with the group, that's a great way to learn. Um, maybe you um, participated in a Christmas bird count this year, contact people you were birding with then, or mm -hmm. um a master naturalist group. If, if you uh, are a beginner birder and, and don't have any birding buddies yet, reach out to the local master naturalist club and see whose birders there they are. Um, Pam has a heart of gold for just joining us today, but all of our master naturalists have just tremendous hearts and, and want to share their love of outdoors and their specialties mm -hmm. with, with everybody. True. So that's a great place to look for somebody to go out birding and DBBC with. <laughs> so, what rare birds have you seen this year oh this year let's see I'm, uh, I go blank <laughs> I, I'm just trying to think we we've had um hmm I can't think of anything right now because you asked me I, I <laughs> well I get off and I'll think of everything but uh basically um saw some mountain bluebirds the other day now that I think about it uh, Paul Sellen who's one of our local really good birders who moved here from Houston. He lives over in the Ingram area. He, he has had a calliope that he's reporting at his house. And uh, then he, there's some uh, over in the Ingram area, some mountain bluebirds, which was fun to go over and see them. Uh, I've seen them before, but you know, to see them here, I think it's really cool. That's neat. Well, and I think mm -hmm. that's the neat thing about the rare birds this year. It's maybe not birds that are truly rare or, unique or, or, or um, sparse but maybe mm -hmm. they are just in an area that we don't typically see them yes. and so one, one thing that I think will be interesting is as we have seen a very uh an increase in everyone's birding activities because of the pandemic and hopefully we see a um, an increase this year in the great birding great backyard birding count um mm -hmm. you know maybe they're not necessarily rare to that area and maybe we just haven't opened our eyes and, and really looked in some of these areas that we're we're actually looking and birding in and maybe they live there all the time and we just haven't kind of found them yet so I think yes. it'll be interesting mm -hmm. I had a friend the other day that saw a laughing gull just come through and she said it was exhausted sitting on the dam over at Guadalupe Park and uh, she said you know she, of course she made sure that's what she saw she was thinking it was a little bit of Franklin. Then she looked closer. It was a laughing gull. And she got some really good pictures. And I think that's another thing. It's a lot of fun to take a picture and then bring it home and see what you can do. Then you can also put it on iNaturalist 
and get some help with it. Maybe you, if you want to take a, it'll give you some suggestions. You can take one of the suggestions and post it. Then other birders can get on there and if they need to, they'll correct you. And so you learn. Right. Uh, absolutely. I think so that's, yeah. A lot of people are afraid of making mistakes. And I think that you have to go ahead. It's like everything. You have to make a mistake if you're going to get better. So I'm real good yeah. at that. <laughs> absolutely. So talk a little bit about iNaturalist. So I know in our previous conversations before we came live, you mm -hmm. are an avid eBird user and iNaturalist user. So kind of tell us the differences in your personal perspective between the two. You don't have to pick a favorite, but maybe tell mm -hmm. everyone who, you know, those of you who are iNaturalist lovers and those of you who are eBird lovers, Pam is an example of someone who does both. And so talk a little bit about why uh, okay. you use both and what, what, what features both have to offer. Okay. Well, I'm an and person in the first place. I'm not an or. It's funny how people say, do you like to play tennis or golf? You know, it's like a new gentleman that said, what happened to and? <laughs> but uh, eBird, it's like, I feel like that specifically they're mapping and it's for, I feel like that my day birding, I'm, I'm sharing with somebody else that maybe that can't get out and bird, or maybe also I'm sharing with somebody that might want to come in at some point and do some type of a study. So that time is is donated to them. And I naturalist, I feel like it's uh, again, it's a compilation, but it's more of a visual compilation. You've taken pictures. Nobody, I don't think either one of my kids are going to want to inherit all these pictures. But once I take a picture or get one that's, I send in some that are not just real, real good because it's a bird I'm really excited that I saw. But hopefully that if somebody needs to use that picture or, you know, didn't get to go birding that day and they want to go pull up our naturalist and identify birds, it keeps them sharp. If they've been working all day and they want to come in and go birding, they can do it that way. They can come through and they go, oh, Pam, you didn't get that right. You know, and they'll tell me and I go, oh, because of this. Okay. And then I cross it out and go on. And I think that's one thing that I think a lot of people are hesitant to join in because they're afraid of being corrected. And to me, it's like if you're taking gymnastics or anything, it's a correction that makes you learn, you know, and it's nothing personal, you know. Absolutely. And I think that that's a true statement because, you know, um, I can tell you, you took a great picture, but that doesn't do anything for you. And if mm -hmm. we say, you, you, this is a nice picture, but this, this, and this are ways mm -hmm. you can improve it. That's something that I think that, um, I think you make a great point on that. And I bring that back from a livestock and working with our kids perspective. Mm -hmm. um, if I tell if I tell my kids they're perfect or they're great all the time, that they're not getting any constructive criticism. And, and some might think that my constructive criticism is, is but yeah, it's not a place that. of love to make them better, not yeah. always a place of criticism. So mm -hmm. yeah, and also it's like an aha moment where you go you see through new eyes that same bird and you go, wait a minute. You know, it's like when you're talking about, I took a duckology class the other day, which was oh. so super through Bayer Audubon. And the, the sweet lady was talking about looking the, at the, where's the white on the duck? And I mean, that I told my daughter about that. My daughter and son-in-law are very much into birding. It's actually, they're the ones that got me into birding. And so my daughter says, that's the kind of thing that you're looking for, that little pearl that you're looking for to remember when you're out burning, where is the white on the deck? You know? That's a great point. So as we mm -hmm. kind of wrap up our 30 minutes, I want to remind everyone, if you've joined us, please comment where you're from. Um, and so Pam, we are excited though, um, to share this evening or this morning, this afternoon, whatever time you're watching this, um, that burning the border here in Del Rio, based out of Valverde mm -hmm. Kenny County, we are starting to fill up. And one thing that you had mentioned was taking pictures and getting better at, your, at photography and um, in iNaturalist using pictures in iNaturalist. And that's funny. Um, we I wanted to remind everyone that we do have our photography tract open. Um, our professional photography guide is Laura, Laura Keeney. She uh, did the big year with pictures one year um, and mm -hmm. photographs more bird species uh, than anyone else. And so she is going to be our photography guide. We're excited to have her join us and then we are starting to fill up on our trip so uh baker's crossing trip is now full um we've got a few trips like below the dam zuber Biller's ranch mm, what's my other one that are starting to get full like there's one or two more spots on those so guys if you um want to get registered get registered soon 
Um, and then we have a handful of trips that have several spots left. So if you are wanting to come to Birding the Border, we really encourage you to get registered. Um, please know that we have made all the preparations to have a safe and fun event and program. Um, but if for any reason there was a need, and we don't foresee this being an issue, but for if any need to cancel uh, due to change in state, local, um, or agency guidelines that, that everyone would get a full refund if we we if we can't host the program. So um, please trust us that we are doing everything in our power to host a great safe program and think that we have got plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D, plan Z already, <laughs> depending upon what those guidelines look like um, and making sure that we host a safe, a safe event for everyone. Um, and a lot of those uh, will be, we'll, we will publicize what plan A, B, C, or D we have to go with uh, as we get closer because we know that uh, agency guidelines and state and local guidelines can also change. And so uh, while we want, we there is a strict set of guidelines that we will be following, um, some of them can change based upon those guidelines changing. So we're excited to be hosting that this April, April 29th, May, April 30th, May 1st, and May 2nd. So. Um, and Pam, speaking of master naturalists, for all the master naturalists joining out there, we do have a advanced training uh, page on our website that you can just click on, print off with the suggested advanced training hours, and you can turn that into your master naturalist chapter for approval. Um, but we, we've made that easy for what we suggest that you apply for, um, and then a quick, easy print for you to submit. We thought that might be helpful. Okay. <laughs> We've started doing that with all of our birding with extension programs because we feel like they are quality advanced training hours for those that want to hone in on their birding skills, especially since we host the um, afternoon birding with extension seminars and we send you out with professional guides that we really hammer on to make sure that, that we are educationally driven. So in the field, we are mm -hmm. not only are we being a professional guide and sharing what birds are out there, but we're really sharing the educational piece to make everyone a better birder when they mm -hmm. leave. So. Absolutely. Sounds it's fun. <laughs> well, and good luck on mm -hmm. the upcoming great, great backyard birding count. <laughs> are you gonna be doing that with a group? You said you were gonna go to the river trail, but are you gonna be doing that no, with a no, group? No, just or? my husband and I, we'll, we'll just bird. And uh, we do have a group that we, of five that I bird, I'll be birding with tomorrow. Just, you know, that we have different groups through the master naturalist, but we only have five. We all wear our masks and we stay separate. Actually, you know, in the wintertime, masks are wonderful. <laughs> they keep you warm. <laughs> they're, they're really, a, and if, the, if you're like me and have problems with cedar fever, that keeps this, a lot of the cedar out too. So uh, yeah, it's, so it's maybe a, a fashion trend even after we, the mask mandate's gone. Oh, I can believe that. I can believe that. Yep. Well, we want to say thanks to Marcy and Beth and April and Miss Erin for joining us. Um, mm -hmm. We're excited to see you. And since Marcy joined on, I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there. I uh, definitely want to remind everyone uh, that at Birding the Border and, um, and, and Pam, you talked about starting off with your little binoculars. Um, mm -hmm. Lance C and Sky is our optics educational partner. So if anyone has any questions about your optics or wanting to improve your optics, Lancy and Sky um, is planning to be at our birding with extension programs that they can be at, but always just call. They, they're a wonderful resource. If you have questions about your optics, they'll definitely help you out over there. So we love that they're a Texas-based company and um, you can always go back. Marcy joined us for Cup Chat a couple of weeks or months ago. I mean, we had a great time talking about binoculars. So go back in our history or on our YouTube channel and you can check those out. So we're going to save you a lot of time. I wish if you're not using the right binoculars, you can you can get discouraged birding. That's for yes. sure. Yes. yes. And did you know you're not supposed to clean them with the bottom of your T-shirt? <laughs> well, I thought you're supposed to breathe on them and then use your T-shirt, right? <laughs> oh, that's not what Marcy says. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I've, I've bought the Zeiss wipes, you know. I was getting them out the other day, and one of my friends says, oh, you can't use wet wipes on your binoculars. And I was like, no, that's Zeiss. But uh, yeah, 
Yeah. Yes. But yeah, there it's a. Uh, if actually that's who I bought my uh, my particular my current binoculars from, Lansing's guy. So, also one thing we didn't bring up is that uh, Wild Birds Unlimited uh -huh. is is sponsoring the um, Christmas the Christmas. Listen to me, Great Backyard Bird Camp this year oh, yes. again, and that it's um let's see. National Audubon, uh, Cornell, and uh, Birds Canada is yes. also part of it. So yeah, they are yeah. the the partnering organizations that really encourage backyard GBBC. Yes, uh, y'all actually <laughs> have a great Wild Birds Unlimited in Kerrville there. So yes, we do. Uh, we that do. is, if you're in the Hill Country area, there is a Wild Birds Unlimited there in Kerrville. Um, I've been very blessed to work with them several times and I've answered any questions I have when I when I'm talking about bird feeders and I'm um, getting all my stuff ready for um, for some of our producers out here um, who are part of our birding the border program so that's been really mm -hmm. neat is uh, getting there utilizing your because that's the closest store to us here in Del Rio is so I utilize the Kerrville store and mm -hmm. um, to help some of our producers uh, get their feeding plans ready for uh, to for birding the border, so mm -hmm. that's been fun. They're great. Yeah, people. Linda writes a really nice um, monthly little newsletter about what's happening at her ranch, which is fun to read. If you haven't gotten to get out and go birding, you can just virtually experience it through her. <laughs> yeah. yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you, Pam. We are we okay. are coming up on our thirty minutes, so we try to kind of keep it there. Do um, you have anything else you want to share with everybody? No, just uh, be sure and bird and and. Uh, it, oh, be nice to people along the way so that we we can keep, I was always uh, with groups that were really nice when we were birding to try to include people so that you encourage them to want to be birders too, instead of thinking that we're strange. <laughs> no, not ever would people think birders are strange. Not obsessive at all, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we talked about that. I went, so funny you say that. Again, no rules, we'll keep going. Um, Funny you say that is everyone has different hobbies and I would assume that birders might look at some people who fly model airplanes and spend thousands and thousands of dollars on building model airplanes as, mm -hmm. as a very odd investment and you know I have I particularly have a livestock hobby I spend thousands and thousands of dollars on livestock and so <laughs> you know it's all about what your hobby is and, and to, to think any of any of them are strange it's whatever anyone's cup of tea is and so birds birding are your is cup of tea. yeah so. birding is contagious though it really is you have to be careful once you put those binoculars up on a bird especially like just start with a blue jay look at all the colors in a blue jay it's amazing yes, i birded with i birded without binoculars for probably three years i have just been in it's a joke on cup side cup chat that I have very good eyesight and so I typically don't use binoculars wow. uh, when I was beginning to bird because um I was lucky enough that I, as a birder I started with a professional guide all the time because mm -hmm. of birding with the extension program so when I wanted to see the bird typically the professional guide goes oh it's right there it's very close to us now um mm -hmm. and so I was spoiled for sure and yeah. so I have just gotten to be a regular binocular carrier. Um, and it is so amazing how different birds look just to the naked eye versus through the binoculars. So um, mm -hmm. yes, that's, it is yes. amazing, but it's just, it is, so, it's been fun. So anyways, it was great to have you, Pam. And thank, thank you. you so much for well, sharing. thanks for having that. me. <laughs> Absolutely, so, but happy, great, backyard birding count everyone we will put a link in the comments today uh to the website where you can find more information about that and you don't have to sign up pam correct you just have to start birding and put it in ebird mm -hmm. so spend your 15 minutes and participate this year and let's have a record number of great backyard bird count participants here in the state of texas so thanks a lot thanks so much everybody and we hope you have a great wednesday we will talk to you later.